we want you to pull on the rope as hard as you can on your own. And you go, okay, right, I'm on my own pulling rope. And then they say, okay, we're going to do it with two people now. And they had someone, a kind of imposter, stand behind you. And you're still blindfolded. Making grunting yeah, noises. and make grunting noises, essentially. Yeah. Like, okay, Mark, there's two of you pulling now. Go. And someone's going, oh, oh behind you. Right, Andrew, are you ready for a little bit of myth busting again? Myth busting, history journey, whatever you want to call it, I'm I'm ready. So have you heard of the Ringelman effect? I am aware of the Ringelman effect. Ringelman effect, and sometimes the Ringelman effect is called social loafing, um, but they're different. And, and I'm really guilty of this. I wrote an article probably 10 years ago now talking about what's the perfect team size. And one of the things that I put into that article was a really brief explanation of what the Ringelman effect was and, and then went straight into social loafing. And in the work that we've been doing, going back and sort of pulling threads on on some of these things, I I started to go back and I realized, as as actually with our Tuckman work, I realized that I'd never read the original paper. So I wanted to go and find out what Ringelman was talking about. If you go onto Wikipedia, there is a statement in the Wikipedia article right at the top, if you look for the Ringelman effect, that says, according to Ringelman, 1913, Groups fail to reach their full potential because various interpersonal processes detract from the group's overall proficiency. Namely, two distinct processes have been identified as potential sources for the reduced productivity of groups, loss of motivation, and coordination problems. So that seems totally reasonable. So we're saying in 1913, there was some really good research that suggested that if you're in a group, uh, the individual effort in the group is reduced and it's reduced for two reasons. One is loss of coordination and the other one is loss of motivation. The really fascinating thing, if you can find a copy of the original Ringelman paper, which is in French, he doesn't say anything about motivation. And that under the hood of this, there's some really interesting parallels with with Tuckman and actually with uh, Frederick Winslow Taylor. In In that, Ringelman was doing something very, very specific, which was then sort of collided with later research. And when people talk about the Ringelman effect, they talk about social loafing. Yeah, later. and I think it's worth mentioning that the last episode we recorded with a guest, with uh, Dr. Gemma Quinn, he talked about her continuous experience with social loafing with student teams in team-based learning. And... It comes up again and again, doesn't it? In fact, if you do the sort of down the pub chat with someone about teamwork, which, you know, I sometimes find myself in those kinds of chats because you say, oh, so what do you do? So I'm, I'm a researcher. I work on teamwork and communication. And like, oh, yeah, teams. Like the problem is that it's just getting everyone to pull their weight. It's fascinating that even that little kind of shorthand for people contributing to teamwork goes back to Ringelman's work, doesn't it? It does. And and hopefully what we can do today, I'm going to do the Ringelman stuff, but I think I hand over to you at a point where that's work, just, and, and that's, that's just you not of... feeling your weight, frankly. You're just going to hand over to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to yeah. loaf my way through the second <laughs> half of this episode. Right. Well, we'll take like talk, talking of pulling weight. Tell us about All Ringelman. Right. So I, I went off and, and I tried to, I first tried to find the, the Ringelman paper, um, not realizing that it's linked in the Wikipedia article that I was criticizing anyway. Um, but and, and it's quite difficult to, to find. And it, the original article is in French. It was written in 1913. Um, I actually found another article called Ringelman Rediscovered, which was by uh, Kravitz and Martin, David Kravitz and Barbara Martin. And this is what sort of inspired me to, to go back and look much more deeply at, at Ringelman and pull the original article, because they they did a really, really nice breakdown of what Ringelman had actually said. What what I want to do is actually tell you a little bit about Ringelman. We'll go through the, the history of what he did. So Max Ringelman wasn't German. Some some later people have said he was a German psychologist. He wasn't. He was a French uh, agricultural academic. And so he was he was active, actually. He did the original research that he then cited in his 1930 paper um, between, I think it was 1881 and 1887. 
So he was working at um, a very well-renowned French agricultural school at Grand One in Brittany. And the, the original, because uh, the original Indies. research, what, he didn't publish it, did he? I mean, he published in 1913, no, he, but the, the actual research wasn't published. It's a nice example of it's a, just because it's not been published doesn't mean it's not useful. <laughs> Yeah, ex exactly right. He he published something, I think, in 19, 1907, but the paper that's always cited is 1913. So he, so he was, at the point that his paper, his 1913 paper was published, he was a professor of rural engineering, or what we might think of professor of agricultural engineering at the National Agronomic Institute of France. He was a director of the machine testing station and a member of the really highly regarded na French National Society of Agriculture. So that's that's who Ringelman was. So you get a sense he's not doing psychological research. He's he's looking at something else. And fundamentally, that's what he was doing. Much like F.W. Taylor, Ringelman was fascinated by trying to make effort more productive. So so turning some some sort of motivation into some sort of a outcome. And the tests that he was doing at this um, the agricultural school of Grand Juan is um, testing, pulling, and pushing. And Ringelman really didn't seem to care whether the pulling and pushing was done by an ox, oxen, or horses, or other agricultural students. And so the big Ringelman paper that, that he published was actually a, a, him getting some of his fellow students, because this was the 1881 to 87 period, he got some of his fellow students to pull and push um, heavy objects in the field. And that's the original, the the original part of the the Ringelman paper. His explanation, Ringelman's explanation in the 1913 paper, he was obviously writing this long after the research was done. He said, "This is his words, um, and forgive the the translation. This is from the French. Regarding the work of humans, our tests were mainly carried out from 1882 to 1887 in Grand Juan on the students who kindly agreed to participate in the research. 26 series of experiments repeated on the same day on the same 20 students from Grand Juan took place in 1883 and helped to establish relationships between different modes of action of the same engines. What he means by engines is the people. So you see that. Yeah, I, that lo I love reductive Because does he not call it like an animated engine? Yeah, I, actually, that is the, the subject the 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 original title is research on animated engines, human labor. It's you know, it's, fantastic. It, when I hear that, I'm like, it's kind of a good name for a team. <laughs> it's, it's, we're an, it's an animated engine. Yeah, it's perfect. Maybe we should call this the Animated Engine Crunch yeah. podcast. And so, yeah. Um, so he he then went on to say, these are the results of the twenty six series that constitute the main subject of this memoir. I would we're going to put this in the show notes, but I would definitely recommend having a look at that rediscovery paper because it actually goes through the evidence that was collected and, and demonstrated by by Ringelman. But if we if we actually break down what he did, what he was actually looking at doing was putting individuals and teams together to push and pull a number of things sometimes in harnesses and sometimes with shafts so he was effectively trying to find out what is the most effective way to apply mechanical force to an object so that i can make agricultural work more more effective the finding that he he had and this is where the wikipedia summary is half right the finding that he had but the only finding that that he had was that um when teams were working together the individual contribution was reduced so that's that's what he found and his theory as to why that happened that he proposed was the difficulty in coordination and clearly that's really really important I mean, he he wasn't that there's this suggestion that ringelman um put forward that it was a motivation issue there is a slight hint of that in his paper but that's it he, he almost says yeah, we, we did find this situation, and this was actually where he was working with prisoners. And again, he's writing this in a 1913 paper of work that he did previously. But there was there was one situation where he was uh, actually studying a, a, a human-powered mill with prisoners pushing around the outside. And he kind of alluded to the fact that there might have been a most motivational problem, but that's not what his 1913 paper was talking about. The The specific quote, from his paper was when several engines work simultaneously on the same piece, the usable effort of each is lower. 
despite the same level of fatigue than if the engines worked separately. So again, engines are humans. And what he's saying is that when you have multiple people working on the same task together, their individual effort is lower than it would be if you measured it on their own. And that's what he did. He effectively was measuring the mechanical power that was exerted by people. And he was very careful to control. This was given that this was in the 19th century. He was very careful to control for fatigue and moving people around different experiments. So he took care in, in what he was doing. He said, we have seen that this is due to the lack of simultaneity of muscle contractions of the individuals paired on the same resistance. It's very clear what, what he's looking at. When two men operate a machine using cranks, it's also noted that the practically usable power does not reach the sum of the individual powers that each man can deliver, even though they turn the crank the same number of times per unit of time. The same is true for animals harnessed in a circular track. So, you know, it's, so anybody that's suggesting this is a human motivation issue, he's explicitly saying, the experiment that I've just run, same is true of horses. It's exactly the same as true of horses. It's, it's very um, simple. In in a sense, it's very simple in that it's like if I'm in a group of people and we're asked to push something, the Ringelman effect in a nutshell is the more people that are in the group, the less each individual actually pushes. Yeah. So it the yeah. if I if I push my, I'll push my hardest when I'm on my own. If you add one other person, I'll push a little bit less hard. If you add another two people, I'll push even less hard. Let me, let me just dive into that because that's, that's not quite what Ringelman was saying. Okay. He wasn't necessarily saying that the individual pushed less hard. He was saying that the outcome of the effort was less. And what he was proposing was that the outcome of the effort was less. Not, not that they tried any harder or less hard because there are other people there. Very specifically, what he said was, we measure less force per individual, the larger the group gets. And actually, he did it with, I think, uh, an, one individual and then gr groups of increasing numbers, I think up to up to eight. And so he was, he actually, his, his charts, his data actually showed the decreasing effort as, as the groups increased. But what he was specifically saying was, it is hard to coordinate the effort of those individuals and the lack of coordination, not the lack of effort. So it might still be that the same, you had the same input effort, but the output that was measured was less because of coordination. So he wasn't actually suggesting that the, the effort was lower. He was saying that the output was lower. So it's overall output, which is, yeah, which exactly. you then divide down and you establish that effort is x on your own or if output is x when you're on your own the overall output divided by the you know of people is x minus something when when there's more than one person so it, it's yeah. interesting even and that is an example of how the way in which the story travels through time i've just done i've just done that mistake i i've yeah the you mentioned the Ringelman effect is, you know, loss of coordination and motivation. Um, the original research was done on the, the, the difference between output between individuals and then uh, increasing groups of people. I immediately interpreted that as, well, that tells me that they're not working as hard, which is not, yeah, you know, it's not exactly. strictly, as you say, it's not strictly what he established in his work. That's exactly right. And and that's why it's important to reflect on the fact that he really didn't care if he was man measuring oxen or horses or, you know, so beasts of burden or machines. Because at that point, this was the era that steam engines were starting to um, to take over from the work of um of, of animals and, and people. It, it, if you go back and look at the research, he was even, there's another point in there where he, he was saying um, the, the previous efforts are weaker than those obtained from work with a traverse or a shaft, even when the man pulls partly with his arms acting on the shafts and partly with the harness. This is due in our opinion to the fact that the man working on the shaft is forced to subject his arm to a torsion of 90 degrees so that the metacarpals apply themselves to the hand. He's going into the, the physical details of how to make the engine more effective and and as at that point where he said this is exactly the same thing that we would witness with horses he, what he's done and quite correctly although this sort of misattribution or, or, or muddling of the water ringman's work is is absolutely spot on 
the effort of teams of you know of teams of engines not even people is lower than an individual when you measure the output because coordinating those things is difficult and that's fine. Like we, we know that we know that the larger a group gets, the harder it gets just to coordinate the effort to, because the, the management overhead that is required to synchronize all the effort is really, really high. And if you really break it down to an atomic level, that on its own is powerful, but too many people then claim that Bringleman had some element of motivation in his original work, which he didn't. Um, and that, that doesn't really matter, but it, let's just try to educate people about what Ringelman actually said and not conflate that with social loafing, because actually social loafing is almost the superior version of the theory that came along much later in the 20th century. You don't have to be a genius to hear those results and then go, okay, but with the humans, <laughs> yeah. I, I don't yeah. know, I don't know about horses motivation, but with the humans, we all can instinctively say, yeah, but you just, there's always people that just don't try as hard. And fortunately, there's, there's now, you know, there's a whole body of research that ex extended Ringelman. Um, and I think that's, that's probably the segue into the, the work of Ingham first, and, and then maybe Latane later. What needed to be established was, I guess you say, Ringelman found something really interesting out. <laughs> and yeah. when you're then thinking about group work and teamwork in the context of organization, business, and, and other forms of uh, kind of coordinated work. When you start to think about it in those contexts, you are almost without needing to qualify it, you're moving into social processes. And yeah. I think where we'll end up coming back around full circle is that Ringelman isolated the physical, the instrumental physical coordination puzzle, and then further research tried to pick up the social puzzle. And then where we land uh, at the end of all of this in terms of teamwork is to, is to recognize that there's a very complex uh, interaction going on between the sort of instrumental and then social processes of coordination. The Ingham work, which we can talk about was one. Prior to that, you had Steiner. That was probably the research that established, well, there's, yes, we can recreate the Ringelman uh, experiments and determine that it's loss of coordination. But that work also probably was the, the work that established there's inadequate social coordination as well with humans. All the, work, all the work we're talking about now does not involve agricultural animals. Yeah, there's no more horses yeah. or oxen in this part. We've, we've, we've yeah. graduated exclusively to human research here. So Steiner's work sort of determined that we're talking about social coordination. And then the question, I suppose, is fine. We know that when people are exerting force there's some kind of loss of overall output compared to what each individual is capable of exerting force wise physical force wise um and we know that social coordination with humans probably has a part to play in that overall outcome or output i suppose you're, you're better saying but how do you isolate the effects so there's a suggestion that social coordination is playing a part but how do you demonstrate that it's that and not the other thing and that's yeah. that's where it's useful to take a a little pit stop around the work by alan ingham and colleagues so you, george levenger and james graves and they did the the good old psychology experiment thing of well, we need to isolate something, and we can't we can't exactly do it in a natural way. We'll trick people. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and I don't mean that in a, in, in, a, in a malicious way, but you know that's that's effectively what they did. They're still in the realm of the 
thing that they're looking at, so like the unit of analysis, I suppose you might say, but the thing that they want, they're wanting to study that people are doing is still physical exertion. So they replicated the Ringelman experiment uh, of pulling on a rope, so exerting force on a rope. First of all, they established the same, they kind of repeated Ringelman's uh, processes to establish the same baseline effect. So they can say, well, you know, in the same way that Steiner uh, established, there's this um, an inverse uh, relationship between the output and the amount of people doing it. So the more people you add, the 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 less uh, force per individual being exerted. So Ingham and his colleagues established that, and then they did a clever thing. Then what they did was, so they measured how much force does one person exert when they pull on the rope. How much force is exerted when two people pull on the rope? Four, six. Then they blindfolded the participants. And they, so it's, let's say you were a participant. Say, okay, Mark, we're going to blindfold you this time. We want you to pull on the rope as hard as you can on your own. And you go, okay, right, I'm on my own pulling rope. And then they say, okay, we're going to do it with two people now. And they had someone a kind of imposter stand behind you and you're still blindfolded making grunting yeah, noises and make grunting noises essentially yeah. like, okay mark there's two of you pulling now go and someone's going oh, oh behind you and then and then they did it with four and they did it with six and guess what the results were that there was still a decrement there was still a, a reduction in the overall force produced even when you believed that someone was pulling with you so what that determined was well actually there was only ever one person pulling but when you believed there was more than just you pulling your input reduced which isolated the social effect because yeah there was no there was no difference in the physical effects isn't science awesome because it, it, it really shows that because the the Ingham et al. paper, that was called the Ringelman effect, right? So the Ringelman effect, studies of group size and group performance, that's what that paper was called. And I think that has a part to play in it being conflated with the motivational elements. But it was such a great experiment because, like you say, it was isolating a thing. And where, where what Ringelman had evidenced was the output is lower. They They weren't they weren't talking about uh, he he wasn't talking about effort in that context he was saying the output is lower because of coordination and then this extension of it from Ingen et al was really powerful because then it says if it's not just the output that's lower the input is lower as well so which, you know, the the actual effort being provided by that person is lower not because it's being lost through some sort of mechanical um mechanical loss in the system but actually because the person is trying less for some reason. So that gets picked up by another group of scholars who are then interested in this social effect. So they're kind of going, okay, we've recognized that now we have established that social coordination is definitely a thing and it's acting independently of any physical uh, coordination loss. Because I suppose one of the questions that remained there was, you know, is there some kind of physical feedback that you're experiencing when you're doing something uh, like pulling on a rope that results in coordination loss? Is it the physical act of pulling as a group that creates this loss? Now, that may be the case, but independently of that, there is clearly also a whole set of social dynamics that are um, imposing their own impact on on the processes. So Biblatane and colleagues who picked this up and went to went to look into the the sort of social dimensions more specifically um, because albeit it had been isolated it was then about well what's what's causing it what's actually happening in these social processes that that lead to this effect um, of kind of loss of social coordination. Um, and I should, I th- it's probably worth saying at this point, 
the nice thing about all of this stuff on social loafing, as it came to be called, and it was Biblatane and uh, his colleagues who coined that term, uh, social loafing, in this paper that picked up from Ingham. Um, in so it was so Ingham uh, and colleagues published their work in in 1974, and Latane and colleagues published their work in 1979. It's worth mentioning that these experiments have been replicated and validated on a number of occasions looking at different formats of this of the same kind of things and exploring different parts of the dynamics so it's it's a it's a well established phenomenon probably the best way to put it latane williams and harkins uh, in this 1979 paper they picked it up a really neat thing that they did in fact i think it's worth highlighting the elegance of the actual experiment that they ran is that they needed to look at something that was kind of intrinsically social. So you've got the Ringelmann era work, Ringelmann himself, Steiner, Ingham, which was all principally physical activity. The neat thing that Latani, Williams and Harkins did was they found some activities that were physical but were intrinsically social at the same time. Yeah. So the activities that their participants did were clapping and cheering. These are physical things that we as humans engage in, but they are social things as well. We 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 only clap when we're around others. I don't know about you. I I, I clap on my own. <laughs> If you if you send a really good email, you give yourself a round of applause. Like, you know, <laughs> yeah, it's it's really high motivation exactly. stuff. Exactly. Yeah. So these are intrinsically social activities, but they are are are, are they are manifest in 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 a, in, a, in a physical activity as well. So that in itself is a really clever thing to do to try and um, pivot the focus of this kind of set of effects into a social realm, and essentially they did the same thing. They said, okay, uh, we're going to ask you to clap, uh, uh, or we're going to ask you to cheer. And they got, they got people into it, sat around in a group, and they would get the kind of allocated sequence of things to do. And you'd be told, okay, Mark, it's your turn to clap, it's your turn to cheer. And then it'd be like, oh, Mark and Andrew, right, you're going to cheer this time. And they would count them down. And they established the same effects. So uh, the, uh, the, and they were me measuring with, um, you know, noise pressure. So uh, the amount of noise created by one individual was louder than the individual inputs of noise pressure created by two people when they were shouting together. Yes, the overall output was higher but the proportionate input was lower so basically the larger the group got the less noise each individual was making both when they were clapping and when they were shouting and that, that's clearly not a, a coordination thing right because you don't particularly need to coordinate clapping and cheering other than um, starting and finishing roughly at the same the same time so so it, it's quite nice that it it very clearly does exclude that element of coordination to to a large uh, extent that was so much part of what Ringelman was looking at yeah you don't you don't look necessarily for or it's quite difficult to get a sense of feedback in in these things uh, that's for sure the, the nice thing about the, the clapping the cheering is it's still what would be termed a maximizing task I, I probably should have said that they asked them to make as much noise as they could. So the so I say maximizing. They were instructed that when they are asked to cheer and clap, they the the goal is to make as much noise as possible. So that means that you've got a goal of doing it as much as possible. It means that everybody is doing the same thing. So they call it additive. So you and I both have to shout. We both have to do the same thing, and both of our inputs count under the same unit of measurement. Um, so it's additive and it's unitary in that it's just one measurement of output. 
so that there there are no sub goals or you know um interdependent processes in place here uh, so yeah the experiment was done they established that the same thing happened then what they uh did was they put i mean it's the 70s so i don't know if we could say noise cancelling headphones but headphones certainly that um that uh, big padding yeah i mean yeah. i guess i Air guess you could, you could probably put things that just blocked loads of noise in those headphones they played the noise of other people uh shouting so the the point being that they were trying to manipulate how many people were shouting at, at a time uh, according to the um the experience of the participants and they went through the 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 process again um and the same the same effect was established so what they've done is in a way it's the same as blindfolding uh, that ingham and uh, colleagues did uh even when you aren't getting the direct sensation of shouting with one other person or three other people the reason they were playing the music in the in in the ears was it blinds your ears to how many other people are yeah. actually shouting or how many other people are actually clapping that resulted in the same thing so the there was a, a, a loss of uh, overall output the more people were actually making noise was there anything in that in i guess specifically in latane's um research that indicated why it was happening and i guess that's true of both ingham and latane did did they did they put forward any suggestions as to what might have caused it yes they did and there's been loads of further work on this um which I, I only say that just to say they found out some really interesting stuff. Um, it's been developed and other theories have been uh, introduced since then. But their original findings were really interesting and they still endure uh, and they still make complete sense. So they essentially divided their suggestions for what it all means into three. So they talked about the effect of attribution and equity. They talked about Submaximal goal setting, and they talked about lessened contingency between input and outcome. Can you translate those things into less academic yeah. terms? I think the effect of attribution and equity to me is a really interesting one because it overlaps with a couple of other sort of psychological theories about our perceptions of the world around us. But essentially, what it's about is how sensitively we can identify the precise efforts of others. And that's a that's almost a sort of physical thing, but then it relates to our sense of equity and fairness. So, if we're being told to shout as loud as we can, we've got a big social sensor in our heads being like, "Yeah, but how loudly is Mark shouting?" Like we've both been sh asked to shout as loud as we can, but the two of us are being asked to shout. I want it to be fair. So I don't think that I should be shouting louder than Mark. So we're almost in a, a bit of a Mexican standoff trying to work out, well, how, how loudly is the other one shouting? And then I need to, I'll, I'll pitch myself um, accordingly. I'm doing a bit of an, uh, uh, I'm about to do a bit of a, a pivot, my own, in, like, you know, kind of e extrapolating out into other uh, psychological theory here. So, you know, health warning, but um what the paper, what they what they discuss in the paper is they're basically saying the interesting thing is that we will always hear our input as louder than those of people around us. Yeah. From a psychophysical perspective, we will always attribute the noise produced in this setting where it's production of noise. But this this power law applies to loads of things. Pressure, you know, it's not just noise, but in this case, it was noise. I will always attribute a lower output judgment on what I hear coming out of your mouth compared to what I hear coming out of my mouth. When you mix it with yeah. our sense of fairness, 
we're both going to be um, continuously down downgrading our sense of how of how much we should be putting in because we're judging the other person's input to be lower and then we're going well that's not fair so i'll make mine lower and <laughs> we essentially we're kind of dragging each other down i mean obviously the this type of experiment has been re replicated in loads of situations where and including some of the the research through the 2000s where it's nothing to do with physical effort or uh, or how much noise that you make so that is definitely appropriate for the that latane work which is very much about noise making but we see we see this social loafing applied almost regardless of the team or the group work situation right yeah and that's where other psychological phenomena come in because there's a concept called overconfidence bias it basically the the <laughs> the, the the headline news on overconfidence bias is we all think we're better than we are um and that applies to all kinds of situations uh you know the the, the studies that are done are things like you know the, the famous one is on average um how good a driver do you think you are and it's like 97 percent of people think that they're above average driver yeah. And, yeah. and and so on of course, that can't possibly be true in a in a distribution. So, overconfidence bias is something that humans are prone to, and there are three kind of categories of overconfidence bias. But probably the ones that are most applicable here are overestimation or overplacement. So, within overconfidence bias, overestimation is essentially what is the actual value of our of our individual performance. So how on average, how do we judge the level of our performance? And we tend to think it's better than it is. Um, and then overplacement yeah. is how do we judge our performance relative to others? And we tend to think uh, our performance is superior to the performance of others around us. And that's just a general psychological phenomenon that exists across all categories for individuals on judging their inputs. The point being that that's very likely what you're seeing in teams more generally is the phenomenon of attribution and equity that um, Latane and colleagues identified within a social experiment that was to do with noise production. And it's probably perpetuated through things like, you know, overconfidence is probably the, the, the moderating feature that happens in, in kind of purely social cognitive um, uh, situations. That was the first thing. And it really drills down into what I think is that deeply held sensitivity for fairness that we have in, in what we're doing. Um, and the thing I like about it is there's a lesson there in general for teamwork is that if you accept as someone who operates within a team, you say, actually, a kind almost a sort of universal truth of operating in a team is that you're always going to judge what people around you are doing to be of lower value, lower output, lower quality, and that's incorrect. It's a mind trick you have to play in yourself because if everybody's <laughs> doing it and, they're do and they are incorrect in that judgment, everybody's dragging each other down. I want to look into that antagonism part a little bit. Um, so the, the antagonistic approach to reduction of, of effort. and one of the things that I wanted to mention was I in looking in looking up the research around Latane and Ingham, one of the things that I found was the sucker effect. So Nor Norbert Kerr proposed this thing called the sucker effect. And there is a very slight difference in what he proposed to social loafing. So in social loafing, the Latane version of this, um, it struck me that it was sort of non-aggressive. The, it was the sense that there is a diffusion of responsibility and the Latane work wasn't specifically saying people are maliciously reducing their effort. It was it was more the sense that when I'm in a group and responsibility for the outcome is diffuse, I'm going to lower my effort to match those of people around me. Like The, the absence of my effort won't be so noticed or so important. Yeah, you know, that's a really was... important point is... And this comes, I mean, without getting too technical about the, the, the research processes, but 
um, well, sort of, let's get technical. Latane came up with this concept of, of, of social impact theory. And that's really what is in that first kind of finding. That's what, that's what that we're referring to is there's a, there's a signal that's been sent to a group of people. The social impact diffuses the, the, the responsibility for it. Um, and it's not, it's not malicious. It's not, it's not kind of, you know, self-serving or something. It's just a natural phenomenon of diffusion. And it works in the opposite way as well. Like, if you're down the pub with a group of friends and there's six of you and five of them are getting torn into the drinks and you're like, hey, uh, I'll sit this round out, you know, the social impact you feel as an individual trying to kind of make another choice, the social impact is going to be stronger the more group, the more friends there are. If you're with two friends or one friend, it's socially easier to say, I'm not going to do what the group's doing. So the social impact diffuses yeah. or concentrates in, in both directions. And I think as well in the Latane piece, there, there was almost a sense that some of this was not necessarily the high ego thing that you described, but actually I'm not important and so they won't notice my my effort was actually one of the other things that, that kind of came out of that research. So I think the, the thing that stood out for me when I, when I look at Latane, Latane and then this later Kerr piece of work was... Latane was quite passive and it was it was sort of non-aggressive and non-malicious. Kerr did a, a piece of research that apparently was similar. So I haven't read this this paper, but I've seen summaries of it, which um, had groups where they were there was a team exercise um, and the groups were encouraged to perform, but they could manipulate how they would perceive the efforts of other, others around them. And so there are two really important parts to this. That, that there's the concept of free riding which is kind of related to social loafing. But so free riding, and we've talked about this actually in the Tomasello work and back in the evolutionary psychology work, that in, in cultures, in communities, even um, through primate anthropology, you can see that there is this free riding where, where the group will do something and there will be a free rider that takes part of it. And that's something that actually communication and intelligence has developed to combat because the group is together for a bigger purpose. And then this free riding will happen, but we need to, to get rid of it. So what Kerr was looking at was he was saying, inside these groups, free riding will happen. But what is the impact of individual contribution if free riding is seen within the group? So social loafing was sort of this group thing where my, my, my individual contribution won't count that much. Nobody will notice if I reduce it. Kerr introduced the concept of the sucker effect, which is malicious. And I'm sure that we all have um, can identify with this and have seen it. It's where you you identify that somebody in your group isn't pulling their weight, is free riding. And so your response to that is, well, if they're not trying, I'm not going to try either. So you actively reduce your effort, not because you you feel like it won't be noticed, but almost the opposite. I'm going to reduce my effort because that person isn't trying. The free rider isn't trying. So why should I try harder when they're going to benefit from, from me trying? So the sucker effect, which was, I think, a, 19, it was a 1983 paper, subtly moved on from the, the, the quite nice and social Latane work, which is, yeah, okay, it, it is, it is um, partly to do with coordination. It is, it, there is a strong element of motiva individual motivation, but it's not malicious. And then Kerr came along and said, no, there is another another layer to this as well, which is absolute malicious reduction of effort because you see free riders for whatever reason. Uh, and this is a spiral. And this is where it gets really important for the teams that we see today, because I think we've both seen this in the guests that we've spoken to when we say, what are your red flags for teams? Often it is identifying that somebody in that group isn't trying. It's, it's, it's a lack of motivation. And when you get that sort of bad apple um, problem that one person isn't trying, you see the team spiral. And that's exactly what the sucker effect is. You see a downward spiral for the whole team where entire team output continues to spiral downwards. It's not some fixed reduction. You know, an individual has 0.8 of their output when they're, when they're in a group and that, that lowers as the group gets bigger. And that's probably an important point that we, we should also talk about, about group size, the importance of group size, because it wasn't the same amount of reduction. It certainly wasn't in true in Ringelman's work back at the beginning, but I don't think it was true in Latane's work or Ringelman's work. The reduction increased the larger the group was. Yeah, basically the, 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 the bigger the group, the more exposed it is to social loafing. Yes, yeah, the, the kind of sucker effect is like a race to the bottom. 
It's yeah, because because you don't want to be the sucker. It's exactly you're that's you're working hard. Saying, yeah. That person's getting away with not doing anything. Why should you work? It's got echoes of one of Latani and colleagues' findings, and that's the that was the third one of lesson contingency between input and outcome. So I'll jump onto that. Broad strokes are talking about re- perception of, of of reward for individual contribution. Again, it's a kind of about sensitivity. So being able to get a sense of what the apparent reward is for your input and what your input is relative to other people, when it's difficult to get a sense of how that's being measured, I suppose you could say you become demotivated to, to increase your input or to work as hard as you can. Um, and they, this is this is where it relates to the sucker effect. Is that one way that that happens with the contingencies between input and outcome is h- hiding in the crowd. You recognise that it's quite difficult for it to be to be worked out just how much you are putting the effort in. Essentially, nobody's going to catch you if you slack off, so you can hide in the crowd. A bit like yeah. what. The, the, the sucker effect is about the, the, the reaction of the people around the person that's hiding in the crowd. Um, but exactly there, yeah. that this demonstrates why someone hides in the crowd is because they see, well, there doesn't seem to be much uh, in the way of uh, uh, me- measuring and accounting for how different individuals are contributing to the overall output. The other one is being lost in the cr- crowd in that I don't, see how a disproportionately positive effort or input is going to result in anything yeah, good how for do me. i make any difference so like yeah, exactly. there'll be no extra reward if i make an extra special effort um and so this is about that relationship between what the overall reward is and how you perceive your input relative to others it, it almost feels like you almost have to start from a point of of relative altruism in in the group and then there are these negative effects on it um and maybe in some further episode we'll look at some of the positive effects because this isn't just a downward spiral this is one of the very complex things that's swirling in teamwork that there is this this negative downward pull on on productivity but it it seems that it's tapping into lots of the controls that have been established through our propensity of our evolutionary propensity to collaboration that we're actually looking for those signals we're looking for to to eliminate free riders um and and i think it's that that sense that some of those things that were in the latane work the social loafing work hiding in the crowd and being lost in the crowd the the person who is overall responsible let's say there is some external management responsibility that says i am i'm responsible for the output of this team can't really necessarily identify that that free riding but the group do and that's that's the really interesting signal that comes back so the sucker effect is about the group identifying the poor performers and so there is that whole thing about how do you take the team level view how do you get right inside the team so that you can hear what they're hearing see what they're they're seeing because they are probably identifying where the free riding is happening the street justice uh part of of teamwork it's about also understanding where where the goal of the motivation is coming from because all of these experiments one of the uniting things about all of these experiments is these are groups of subjects who are participating in an experiment who are being given an external task what that doesn't account for when it comes to teamwork is that a really effective way of ensuring that a team has the ingredients that it requires to thrive is that it has ownership of, or at least a significant stake in the development of the goals and the objectives that it holds. We talk about myth busting. We're not necessarily myth busting in terms of the research here. We're giving a we're giving a context and a history to to where this really important phenomenon came from and was established in the literature. But the thing that is they have in common is that all of these participants were being given an external goal. And 
you talk about the these tensions that exist within with all team dynamics and you know we describe it as snakes and ladders because you're coming back to that old adage of uh, of a team is greater than the sum of its parts and it's it's probably pertinent to mention that in this conversation because we're talking about kind of adding up inputs <laughs> um you know this research says well teamwork is not greater than the sum of its parts because the sum of the individual parts are actually lower than uh, they would be if they were individually measured. However, it's about multiplying and dividing. So the coordination loss is a divider. It's a, it's a snake that you slide down in teamwork. It's a trap that you can fall into. But the multiplicative effect that you can get through effective teamwork is a ladder that allows you to, you know, that's the greater than the sum of the parts piece. It, this actually almost allows me to segue into the third finding from Latani as well, is, <clears throat> is to say that the thing that is mentioned in lots of these articles, lots of this research, talks about how there are differences when you have interdependent processes going on. So it's very easy to establish social loafing. It's very easy to isolate it, identify it, and diagnose the conditions that cause it, which are all really important and useful. But as I mentioned earlier, these were all maximizing tasks. So they were additive, they're unitary. So everybody's doing the same thing. Everybody's trying to reach one measurement of a goal. If you're doing something that requires subgroups of people to do subgroups of tasks and coordinate them together, the um, that's where you have the opportunity to create to create the multiplicative effect of that coordination. But it's not something you see evidence of when you're just doing a maximizing thing. But what's interesting is that what Latani and colleagues found was when you put people into a group and give them a maximizing task one of the explanations for why you got loss when you increased the amount of people that were doing the task was that they started to reinterpret the goal. So you say to people, right, you're going to shout, you're going to cheer together, um, make as much noise as possible. And when it's on, when you're on your own, it feels like a very obvious, uh, unequivocal request. Right, I've got to make as much noise as possible. Right, I'll shout. Go. When it's multiple people and probably interacting with these other signals you're getting, like, oh, you know, Mark doesn't seem to be shouting as loud as I am because of these psychosocial things and uh, thinking of equity. What they're suggesting is that people start to reinterpret the goal. So they start, once they're in a crowd, it's like, oh, well, we're being told to shout as loudly as we can, but, you know, there's loads of us. Maybe they're actually wanting us to shout a certain past a certain threshold. And do we clap in time or do we clap exactly. randomly? So we yeah. we we get given the 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 slightest hint of doubt around precisely what the goal is and we start to imagine alternative goals. So they talk about um submaximal goal setting where instead of thinking about we just need to shout as loud as we all can individually, they're, well, maybe they're actually looking for this kind of optimal level that we need to achieve as a group. And I guess we probably reach it together. So you just suddenly pull off the gas as an individual. You're like, well, we're probably, we're probably, there's six of us now shouting. We'll probably make it. It's something I see in some of my other research. It's not to do with this sort of thing exactly. It's to do with decision-making but when a team is unsure of what their goal is, they spend a bit of time making it up. They started out going towards a decision on the basis of a goal that they all understood. They encounter some kind of uncertainty and they start to manipulate the goal to make the situation less uncertain. And it is a different thing, but it's a parallel, a, 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 kind of a different example of that sort of thing happening, which is... It, very easy to get drawn into a subtle reinterpretation of the goal to sort of make your current experience a little bit more comfortable. That sense of a team um, 
feeling like they're just doing enough is certain that that is very much my interpretation of the, the Latane work. I think we need to reconcile ourselves with the fact that that adage about teams being greater than some of their parts is fundamentally untrue in one sense, that the effort of an individual is always going to be less. And I can reflect on this. If you're writing code, it's five times quicker to do it yourself than to try to spread that load across a team, primarily because of the communication. It's me me mechanistic problems, communication, and um, and the, even splitting tasks takes a significant amount of time. So individually, the, every team member will deliver less, less than they might on their own. But that's not the point. You're not looking at teams as if they were some additive of this person's effort and this person's effort. The point of a team is it can achieve something that an individual can't. And that fundamentally for me is one of the differences between teams and groups. A group could be 10 individuals all doing their own thing and you're measuring the output. But a team is something where that loss is actually entirely reasonable. The loss of the individual output is entirely reasonable because of that really significant maximizing multiplicative effort, as you say, or the, the outcome that you say. Individuals can't do what teams do. And that's why we have teams. And that's why we're born to actually do teamwork. Exactly. And nowadays, more than ever, the things that we're trying to achieve require the sort of teamwork that needs the compl it has complexity and it has um the, the sort of scale of the things that we we trying to achieve require teamwork in, in, implicitly so what i was talking about before uh, where maximizing optimizing if you've got an overall objective that requires subdivision of interdependent tasks and you need multiple people to multiple people to collaborate on those sub processes hey, you're talking about teamwork. <laughs> I think social loafing, even as a term, it's characterized in the negative, right? Yeah. It's like, oh, if you put a team together, you'll always get a couple of chancers that try to work less hard. What a lot of this research tells us is that there are actually some sort of, I guess you could even call the kind of bugs in our, our system as individual contributors that make us predisposed to misinterpret what is going all on around us. That's that's number one. And also not necessarily, like you say, also not necessarily to frame in a black and white manner the fact that just because when you scale up to multiple people working together, just because their individual input may overall reduce does not mean it's a bad thing i mean from a point of yeah. view of organizations that's a good ingredient for team resilience the other thing is that it does highlight the the attention you need to pay to the role of motivation and goals and objectives so a really effective team is bound around genuine investment in what the team is there to do and to achieve and that probably needs continuous attention that's something that needs a con con continuous attention to try and keep that um rel relative aggregate input at a level and ensure that there aren't individuals that are dropping way below that but it's the intrinsic investment in the goal it's a moderator on on input because i'm not only thinking about how much other people are doing on the basis of some external pressure that's been put on me. I'm thinking about what I'm doing in order to lead us all towards a goal that we all care about. You are going to have problems with social loafing if a group of people have been given an, a goal or an objective that they had no no stake in whatsoever. It doesn't mean that they have to have arrived at the decision themselves, but if they weren't involved in the in the conception of the goal, then maybe the maybe the circumstances meant they couldn't be. Then you need to price in some social loafing. <laughs> and I, I think your point there—that's a, a great point to end on. That the um, 
the attention that we need to pay here is to make sure that goals are clearly communicated, that they are agreed on by the the team who have a significant um, desire to be included in, in in the outcome or to to partake in the outcome, because that those things are what really make a team function. And you know, I also sometimes hear people talking about how um, they don't want to be part of a team because they go faster on their own. And to that, I think we've got this really important pushback, which says, yeah, you're going to go slower, but you will achieve things that you couldn't on your own. It's double think because you know, the answer to someone who says, I, d- I don't like working in teams because I can go faster on my own. You're like, yes, like empirically, factually, you are correct, but you will go relatively faster. I'm reminded of what Gemma was saying in that conversation where she's, she was going, the, al- albeit it's is a bit of a reverse, but the point was the team always performed better than than the individual, and the kind of input factors are different, but only if you're talking relatively. Because if you if you take it literally, in Ringelman's original study, someone exerted X force, two people achieved significantly more force together. Yes, relatively, their individual inputs, when divided, were lower, but the overall score was higher. And, you know, in a way, you have to squint your eyes slightly, but essentially that, that's what Gemma was finding in, in her contemporary team-based learning for, you know, highly skilled professionals environment, which was the team always did better than the individual. So the, the response to the whole, I, do be- I, do, I go faster on my own, relatively speaking you might yeah and I, I think that's actually a lovely place to to end up that despite ringelman evidencing that coordination is hard and latane showing that social loafing happens because people disappear into the, the crowd and Kerr's sucker effect and malicious free riders and then people reducing the, the downward spiral despite all of those things Gemma could prove that teams in team-based learning had better outcomes than than individual learning behaviors. And that's just one example of it. So finishing on a high, on a quite negative set of findings, you know, we accept those things, we guard against them, but still teams are magical. And social loafing is not evidence of a failing team. It's, yeah. it's evidence of a naturally occurring uh, quirk of human dynamics, but it's something to be accepted and worked with and uh, mitigated but it's not it's not evidence that you shouldn't do you shouldn't engage in teamwork absolutely right well i think that's it for this episode then so we've we've now heard all of the the truth behind ringelman and latane and ingham and kerr hopefully and there's just way more of this on on the horizon as well we've got we haven't even got into the the 2000s and and the more modern research yeah we haven't we haven't we haven't got past the the 80s really oh dear (laughs) (laughs) what a decade